you know, we were sort of bright eyed, bushy tailed and was like, we got the idea, we want to do it. And we just started spending money without sort of, you know, customer discovery, validating and stuff like that. And I love the Nipsey Hussle. Nipsey Hussle got a quote where he says, you know, good decisions come from experience. Experience comes from bad decisions, right? We got better with candy because we had made some stupid decisions with Insta speakers, just spending a ton of money, build a, build a mobile app that cost over six figures before you had even tested the market at all. We spent a hundred dollars launching candy, right? So we went from 200,000 for Insta speakers, which was totally ravished overnight. And we spent a hundred dollars building candy, right? That, like that's that mark of an entrepreneur is like learning a lesson and improving on it. This is Startup Storefront, the podcast where we inspire entrepreneurship through truth. Today's guests are Keithan and Keontae Hedrick, the husband and wife duo behind Candy. Candy is a platform that allows you to video chat with celebrities in real time and was born out of the ashes of their first joint venture, Insta Speakers. The failure of Insta Speakers, while difficult, showed them what to focus their money and energy towards with Candy. And the success of apps like Cameo showed that there was a very real market for personal connections with celebrities. We filmed this episode three days prior to Candy's debut on Shark Tank. So while they weren't able to discuss the specifics of the show, we made sure to cover their preparation for the inevitable Shark Tank bump. So listen in as we cover everything from the importance of surveying the market before starting a business, why celebs tend to overprice themselves, and why Kevin Hart probably wouldn't be the best fit for a service like Candy. Now, back to the episode. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. On today's show, we're talking about the founders of Candy. Question for either one of you to take. Just give a quick introduction on what your company does. Yeah, I can I can take that one. Uh, Candy is a platform that allows fans to video chat with their favorite celebrities and influencers. It's pretty it's pretty much that simple. Straightforward. <laughs> you had a pretty big day here on Shark Tank exploding. Pretty amazing. Congrats for getting on that show. On I wanted to ask you guys, what was that experience like for you? And so we've talked to a lot of companies that have been on Shark Tank. Um, some of them say they're in hotel rooms for two weeks waiting for that call. I know COVID has changed a lot of this stuff. So what was what was getting on the show like for you? How much notice did they give you? How long were you hunkered down just waiting for that that call? Yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, you know most people get on a Shark Tank one of two ways. Either you like audition or, you you know, producers reach out to you. Fortunately for us, we didn't have to audition. Uh, producers reached out to us. Uh, you know, it's a cool experience. I, you know, obviously, you know, yeah, you got to, you know, it's, it's COVID and so restrictions are tight. And, you you got to be patient. Yeah, you got to be patient. And, and, you know, obviously we can't talk fully about the experience, but I imagine that other people that have been on the show maybe had a more, uh, you know, exhilarating experience prior to COVID than, than what we have, right? It's like, it's pretty, you know, they're reg- they're, everything's pretty regimented. And, and nothing, nothing special that you don't see in, in every other industry right now, but I'm sure they probably had a little bit more, a little bit more fun with it. Going back to just your company, what made you guys want to start the company? What opportunity did you guys see in the space? And we're like, all right, let's see if we can do this. Yeah. So actually, we were watching some reaction videos from another company called Cameo, which provides pre-recorded videos from celebrities. And we were like, wow, like this is amazing. Just seeing all the fans being so excited. Like, what if like they can actually talk to the celebrity? Like, what if we can produce something that allows them to communicate with their favorite celebrities and influencers? So from then we were like, okay, like this is the next step, ideally. And we delve into it. Yeah, it felt like the natural next iteration to what they were doing, right? Which was like, okay, this is awesome. If somebody's crying or somebody's like super ecstatic because they got a pre-recorded video from their favorite celebrity, but they got no interaction, you know, the natural natural next iteration is, well, how excited would you be if instead of getting the phone to someone telling you to press play, you got the phone and the celebrity was there, you could interact and ask, ask questions and have a conversation. And so for us, you know, Candy was the pivot from a prior business. So we had a, a company called Insta Speakers, which we launched uh, in late 2019. And that was a platform that allowed users to get a, a video call from a translator on demand. So let's say you're in China, you didn't speak Chinese, you, you know, we're trying to navigate or trying to have a conversation with someone. Within 10 seconds, you could have an English to Chinese translator on the phone, ready to, you know, help you navigate, have a conversation or whatever. And our key customer demographic for Insta Speakers was, U.S. travelers traveling to non-English speaking countries, right? Traveling to non-English speaking countries. So we launched late 2019 in an off travel season on purpose as we were gearing up for the spring and summer of 2020, um, which would be our first travel season. We all sort of know how the rest of the story goes, right? Like, you know, the COVID hits and then our, our customer base literally is wiped out overnight, right? Nobody's traveling to non-English speaking countries. Nobody's traveling internationally. And so we had 
thought of the idea for Candy in December of 2019, but we were focused on Insta speakers, right? So we didn't, you know, do anything with it, just had it in our mind. It was like, hey, that's pretty cool. Once Insta speakers ravaged, we sort of quickly pivoted over to Candy. We always say this on our show all the time. I mean, the mark of an entrepreneur is kind of like an athlete. It's like their ability to, to pivot, their ability to, to take what's in front of them and not sort of not get stuck and not lament and not get all upset about it, but just kind of pivot to the next thing. And so as you guys go down that road, so here you are, you're pivoting, probably not easy, all good, but you have this new idea. It makes perfect sense. You're seeing what's happening in the space and you're like, obviously the next thing is to talk live, just like we're doing right here. And so did you guys go, okay, let me reach out to some celebrities. Do you have any contact? Like what was, what was the thing in figuring out, do celebrities even want this? Like, are they even willing to talk to somebody live? Yeah, so for us, we definitely had to hit the ground running, but we started with surveys because we learned our lesson with previous companies um, or business ideas that we had. So we knew to start with a survey and, you know, reach out to like customers and super fans and even celebrities to see like, is this something that they'd even be interested in? So that was our first step. Yeah, and we surveyed, we sent out surveys to over 2,000 celebrities, right? And I think it was like, it was down like 80% of celebrities said that they want to be able to video chat with their fans for a fee. And 64% of the, you know, fans that we uh, surveyed said that they would pay to FaceTime a celebrity, right? And so once we sort of had those metrics, we had enough of a, a sense that, hey, this is something that people want and that we can proceed moving forward. Because as Keontae alluded to, we we had spent over 200 grand on instant speakers out of our personal money, bootstrap cash, right? And so when that rabbit, you, know, you, re- you learn really quickly that you got to be nimble and that, right? Like, and, and, and that was our first real endeavor, right? And so, you know, we were sort of, bright eyed, bushy tailed and was like, we got the idea, we want to do it. And we just started spending money without sort of, you know, customer discovery, validating and stuff like that. And I love the Nipsey Hussle. Nipsey Hussle got a, a quote where he says, you know, good decisions come from experience. Experience comes from bad decisions, right? I mean, I love that, love that quote because it's like, we got better with candy because we had made some stupid decisions with instant speakers, just spending a ton of money, building a, build a mobile app that costs over six figures before you had even tested the market at all, right? Like just... Stuff that, you know, just is crazy, but it made us better for candy because we we spent a lot of time validating the idea for candy before we even spent any real resources. I, I love to tell this part of the story. Like we spent a hundred dollars launching candy, right? So we went from 200,000 for instant speakers, which was totally ravished overnight. And we spent a hundred dollars building candy, right? That, like that's that mark of entrepreneurs, like learning your lesson and improving on it. I really love what you guys are saying for our listeners. I mean, this is the stuff that we really want to get into. I think uh, I went to business school and I tell people the only thing I learned in business school was the power of surveys. It's like, you know, <laughs> it's like you don't know shit. Like if you're making ice cream, ask people what flavors they like. Stop thinking that you like, you know, mint chocolate chip and you think the, the market likes that. They might. They also probably don't. Well, there's that great story of the JCPenney CEO a couple of years ago. You know, they had hired a new CEO. He came in like he thought he knew it. Everybody wanted. He was changing the, the way the stores were set up, and it tanked. And he was out like within a year or something like that. So yeah, yeah, you see that shit all the time. It's really interesting. The good thing about JCPenney is they have a lot of real estate, and so I think they'll be okay. But yeah, no, I, I love the survey thing. And then the other thing that you mentioned was related to the Nipsey Hustle quote. But but basically, it's like just test. Like I tell entrepreneurs all the time, just test. Like stop, stop the thing, and just test. I remember we were at Y Combinator. I was just telling my wife this story. And there was four of us in the room, three of us, three of us were engineers. And I was like the guy, the sales guy. Right. And so uh, Michael Siebel, who's, who's now the, the, fa- the partner at the CEO at Y Combinator says, all right, cool. Like, what do you do? He's like, oh, I do front end. What do you do? I do back end. Oh, okay, cool. How many customers do you guys have? And he's like, oh, we got, we have one beta customer right now. And he goes, cool. You're all salespeople now. And like, it stunned our engineering team because they had never picked up the phone. That's just not something that they did or sent an email to a customer. And so he's like, but we have to build this product. And Michael's like, who are you building the product for? And, and the guy's like, well, our future customer, how many customers do you have today? And then it likes it, dude, I'm telling it was the best. I, as the salesperson, I was like, yes, let's go, you know? And then from that point on, that's another, another thing. It's like, what do the engineers do? And so from that moment on, what ended up happening is we went back, all the engineers started writing scripts so we can get free leads online through all these like databases, like Zoom Info and stuff. It was like amazing. So next thing you knew, we had like 40,000 people on an email list and we were just pumping through it. And it was like the moment where you realize as a company, like sometimes it's easy to get stuck doing what you're good at, but what you're good at doesn't really matter all the time, right? It's like the dev matters when you have the market, the market, exactly. you get the market. And so the sales matters to get the market. And so those steps become 
pretty good. And so I just love that you guys are sharing that story. Okay, so you, you send out the survey, got it. Everything looks good, it makes sense. Conceptually, it makes sense. And then what is your first step? Because I can imagine some, sometimes these celebrities, is it Instagram Live? Are they, do they want to FaceTime? Is there an intermediary so no one knows their phone number? You know, so what is that? Like, what is the next thing of actually doing the first call look like? Yeah, so it's, it's perfect, right? So if you think about what we do, you know, again, instant speakers taught us to be lean, right? And to stop thinking about the big picture and really think about like at a core what you're doing. So at a core, and you mentioned this earlier, at the core of what we do, we're just connecting two people via video chat, right? Like at the core, like it sounds sexy, like in celebrity video chats and all that, and you think you need to tech, but we use Zoom. <laughs> to this day, we use Zoom, right? We've been operating for a little bit over a year and we've used Zoom because it just hasn't made sense. It, we couldn't justify the expense of building the tech when everybody, you know, through the pandemic, we launched at the height of the pandemic in April of 2020. Everybody's a Zoom expert, has been on a million Zoom, know how to use Zoom. And that's a product that was ready to go. And we could we could spend hundreds hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to build a product that still may not the video capabilities won't be as good as Zoom, right? Like so, it just didn't make sense. So to this day, you know, for us, we were like we skipped past tech. We said we got tech. We know we can use Zoom. We can we can create a link, right? That way, the celebrity has you know anonymity. They don't give out their phone number or anything like that. It's totally safe. It's encrypted. All of the stuff that you need, Zoom's already figured that out. So we got to spend money trying to do that. So that was the cool part. I, and no, that was the, sort of the first step in terms of the first question we saw was like, we're not building tech. Like, yeah. that's not and then as far as the website goes, we just use a Squarespace template. Like instead of having a product or a candle or a shirt, we put the picture from our uh, talent. They gave us a picture that they wanted to show and we just put it up there, their name, their price that they set themselves. And it was just that simple. And that's, that allowed us to be lean and more nimble. Uh, that's how we was able to launch for a hundred dollars. So now you've got the Zoom platform You've got the Squarespace website, and you've got this survey telling you that celebrities and participants alike want to, to connect. So how do you then get the celebrities? How do you reach out to them? Yeah, that's the biggest, that was obviously the biggest part of our business, right? Like that's the big, if we couldn't solve that problem, we had no business. So, you know, what we did was we just start hustling, man. Like, you know, we had to start to put, to put together some celebrity emails from the, uh, for the for the surveys and it's a little bit of everything like we were on the phone with people's cousins we were like on their instagram getting their booking emails we were reaching out to agents and managers we we put together a sales team to get as many uh, you know emails as we could from celebrities again scouring up mostly obviously primarily uh their social medias right like you know they all have booking stuff like that and i and i put together an ebook and some stuff to teach people how to do this because i think the first step for us was getting the emails which is cool that's like the first step but as you know like you it's certain things you got to say to get to garner the answers these celebrities get you know literally thousands and thousands of emails of people soliciting them to promote their product right and your email has to say a, a, some some certain thing key things in order to bite their interest and so you know it took us we've sent literally over 100,000 emails to celebrities literally over 100,000 emails and over that time we've learned like what to say and what not to say what do they want to hear what piques interest what managers care about versus the talent and so you know that was really it i mean like we every we turned over every stone we could about how to you know recruit talent right obviously we did our research we saw how other competitors in the market how they had done it and we you know piggybacked off some of that as well did you guys find trouble so like when i think about companies when they first start sometimes the hard part is breaking through not being known for one thing and so the obvious example is like only fans right only fans is now trying to move away and so with you guys were you guys like oh we're crushing the television market but not like the a-list like what was the thing or was it not like that were you guys finding success across the board and even like managing some of the calls be, was not as easy. You know, I can imagine friction sometimes of like, hey, we said one o'clock and then all of a sudden they're like, like Snoop Dogg's notorious for this shit. He's like, ah, oh, sorry, I'm in the studio. And so like, <laughs> you guys find friction along the way or is it like been easier than you thought? What has that been like? I would say our problem has was inverse. I feel like at the beginning it was it was I, I, honestly a lot easier. And you just got to think about the pandemic, right? Like, yeah. like I always, so I'm an attorney, you know, by trade, right? So I always like akin what we do now to like being a bankruptcy attorney. Like bankruptcy attorneys relish when the economy is terrible 
and their practice goes down when the economy do, is, do, is doing well, right? Less companies are filing for bankruptcy. I feel like for us, as the pandemic was at its height, like our business was the best, right? Because celebrities weren't, you know, think about when we launched April 2020, there was no NBA games, no NFL games, no shows were filming, no movies. So it was a lot easier to get in contact with talent and they were a lot easier to be available, right? You need to somebody, get, sometimes we can get somebody to do a meet and greet the same day that it got booked, right? Like now we went from like, let's say an average of a, two to three email back and forth, you know, booking time. So now it's like eight to 10 emails, right? Because they're back working, they're back on tours, they're back filming movies, right? So it's a lot harder now to, to, to get meet and greets booked as, as easy. Before it literally was like one or two emails and you got it. It's on the schedule, you're ready to go. Now it's like, you know, six follow-up emails and then two emails and then you got to call them the morning of and remind them so they don't forget. It's a little bit, of, it's a little bit more work now, you know, but, but it works out. So you guys were like, let's go Delta, let's go, let's go Omicron. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I just tell people the truth, man. I mean, if you yeah. look at some of the problems we were dealing with, and it's, again, you know, you know, Cameo dealt with the same thing and they created the space. Like, you know, pre-pandemic, if you look, do your research, like they were struggling with the same thing, right? Like it's just you know hard to, to really grow when you're trying to pin talent down to do these and they're busy. And, and they'll tell you the same thing. The, the pandemic was the best thing happened for their business, right? Like they probably had like a $300 million valuation or something like that pre-pandemic. And the height of the pandemic, they hit a billion, right? Like, because it's just it, it, literally companies in our space, if we could have created COVID, and obviously I don't make light of the deaths and, you know, stuff like that, you know, being sensitive to those things. But from a business perspective, it couldn't have been a better time for us. Right. Yeah, no, for us, I mean, it's funny. So we did the podcast this whole time during COVID and I quite literally, no joke, 90, I want to say with, with the exception to one company that we spoke to, they all were two, three times revenue than previous years. And it was basically a function of them just figuring out or leaning into the thing, the only thing that was working, which COVID, I think, simplified. It's like COVID, right. exactly. it's like all this shit's broken. This is the only thing working. We're just <laughs> and yeah, you have to be leaning with more lean with operations, right? Resources were scarce. And so you have to really drill into that. And I think that, you know, for us, you know, it just worked out because it just was so much easier to get in contact with talent. Like I said, managers were trying to find ways to get them and their talent pay. Agents were the talent. A lot of times we have talent, you know, reaching, responding to us directly. Right. Right. Like Coming it just was different ideas. Also, that was pretty helpful. Like not limited it to just a video chat, like have actual events, like cooking events or, you know, studio sessions. So it, it grew from there. Yeah. And, and but like you said, the request of our talent, because again, they were home trying to find ways to continue to generate revenue so that, that their creativity, sort of work with ours. All right. So maybe this is thinking down the road, but kind of to what you just said around cooking, do you guys view events as, as the next thing for you guys? And so not just a one-on-one -on -one phone call, but more of like a tailored discussion or, you know, something that maybe multiple people can buy tickets to. What are you thinking about for, let's say the end of 2022 or even just summer of 2022? For us, events have by far been our most profitable, you know, sort of items, right? Like the one-on-one -on -one meeting greets are great, but the difference with the one-on-one -on -one meeting greets, again, is just it creates a lot of scheduling conflicts, right? And so you're, you're also trying to batch, right? Because you're trying to get this, you know, celebrity to sit down for five minutes to do one meeting greet. It's really not worth their time, right? So, so they want to do, you know, they want to sit down and do 15 or 20. And so we do those type of, so we call like curated events where we come up with these different things. Again, like Maya has done multiple cook with Maya shows where you live in her kitchen she we sent out the recipe in advance and you're going through and she's like your cooking instructor for the day right we've done speed dating events we've done business pitch events so like a lot of our celebrities right they get a thousand emails of businesses asking them to pitch their business we held a pitch competition where businesses came on they have to send their product to the p.o box in advance they got to come on for five minutes and pitch hey this is why you should promote my product right and then we chose two businesses that got free promotion from that celebrity, right? And so, you know, we've done these different types of things and different types of events. And then, but then also the events that we found to be most profitable is us just setting a date for the meeting greet event. So instead of saying, you know, hey, you can go in there whenever you want and you can select the time you want, we just preset it, right? So, hey, meet Keontae on, you know, July 5th at 12 p.m., right? And then pushing all of the bookings there, kind of like concerts, right? If you think about it, that's where our idea came from. It's like we, we make concerts and those are more um, successful because, again, it gives everybody a predetermined date and it gives a celebrity something they can post around. So that's the biggest thing, right? It's like, because we don't, we, we haven't spent any money on marketing and advertising, right? So like it gives a celebrity something that they can post or instead of just saying, hey, I'm on candy, mm -hmm. meet me anytime you want to. Yeah. We're always thinking about this for the podcast. We were on, we were a launch partner with a company called Bright Live. They decided to build their own platform, but it's, it's similar style where they do tickets and stuff like that. 
And so we've been through like with them through kind of the bumpy road of, of, of their platform not really working. I mean, some of the hiccups there were, I mean, imagine like you get, you buy a ticket to an event, but then you have to download a, a Zoom type software. Like that's friction. Like as a tech person, my brain goes like, you're adding too much friction there. It's easier just to use something people already have installed. Even if I get a go-to meeting thing, I'm like, fuck that. I'm not, I don't want to go to. Yeah, it's just too much. It's too much. It's too much. And, and nine times out of 10, you're jumping on a call like 30 seconds before it starts. And then that just throws the whole thing off. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so we've seen them go through it, but now it seems like they have like the lot, they're doing a lot of things with, I would call like maybe A, B listers on the celebrity space. And it seems to be working, but obviously when you're building your own tech, you have, they've made it a little bit harder than I think they needed to. And it's tough, man, like with the A and B listers, and you see that with other platforms, like we all love A and B li A listers and B li and high B listers, but it's it's tough. The economics are tough with those with those types of talent. It's just it's hard to find a price point that makes sense for the company and that makes sense for the talent. And the ticket prices make sense for the fan, right? Like versus, you know, we love Kevin Hart and we would love for him to be on candy, but just the the metrics of it, right? Like it just you know, anything that he does that will have to be for charity and he would have to set it at a rate that he knows. Is not worth his time, but it's more about generating revenue for for charity. But to get somebody like that to do your platform consistently on a meaningful basis, you're talking about ten thousand for a five minute meet and greet time, right? Like it's just nobody can afford that. The people that can afford that are probably his friends. So it's like, <laughs> yeah. And then we also see like with our influencers, like the curated events, such as like birthday parties and things like that. Their fans really love that type yeah. of stuff. So like the the. TikTokers and everything like that. Like they really want to interact with them even more. And we provide that opportunity too. Yeah. And going back to your earlier question you mentioned too, like that is a segment that we, we really grew that really took our business off even, even more was, you know, we, we got a lot of uh, influencers who were lesbian TikTokers. And they really took our platform even to that next level in the height of the summer. Um, they have super loyal fan bases. And, and, and so if you go on our platform, there's a category called WLW, Women Loving Women. And we've dedicated a full category to that population because they just really have been loyal. They love our platform. They have some of the highest rebook rates. You know, they participate and they have some of the most interesting uh, events. We even actually, before, you know, before things, you know, Delta spiked again, we had a, a virtual festival um, that we were doing, a Women Loving Women festival. Um, but a lot of our talent, you know, were struck with Delta. And so it just, we, we had to cancel it. But, you know, it was, it, it's it's a community that really took us to the next level either. You know, that's funny that you say that because we talked with another company who um, we were talking about social media followings. And if you have someone who has a hundred followers on social media, you might look at that and think, oh, this person's a nobody. But if you were to then get a hundred people in a room, that is something that is an event. Yes. And mm -hmm. so it really does depend on how passionate and how motivated and how engaged your individual fan base is. It can make the difference between, you know, you having a successful event with someone who only has 100 followers or a non-successful event with someone who has a million followers, but that don't really care about that person. I talk about that a lot, in, sort of in my ebook. And I, and again, in, in this these products I'm putting together, these digital products, because we talk about, you, you mentioned the word engagement rate, right? Like, you know, and, and telling people like, it, you can't just partner with any celebrity influencer just because you, they have a high number of followers, right? Like if they don't have a high engagement rate, right? At least a 1% engagement rate, then it's really not worth the, the, the investment in capital because, you know, if, if you got a million followers, but, you know, only a hundred of them are actually liking and engaging on content, but you're charging me, you know, for a million people, right? Then that, that, there's a disconnect there. So, you know, we talk about, you know, teaching people and businesses how to really maximize influence of marketing. Yeah. Well, in, in that vein, you said you don't spend any money on marketing. Are you then completely reliant on your celebrity users to, to market it to their crowd? And do you offer any advice to them on how to push it out more effectively? Yeah, absolutely. So as we've evolved, this is something that we have, you know, obviously that's part of the Shark Tank pitch and obviously we can't talk about the results, but the whole reason that is to be able to do more formal marketing because, you know, you don't want to rely solely on your talent long term for that. But as you're starting off, right, and you're, you have limited resources, you really don't have a choice, right? And so what we were able to do was create those events and that would help our celebrities post. So that's what we did to be able to, again, instead of just those generic posts that's like, hey, meet with me on Candy, 
right? Like we all know, like we force demand by setting a date, setting a time. And so a lot of our celebrities, when they post, when they're posting, they're posting for a specific event, date and time that they're promoting around. And we find that to be the most successful because it's like, you know, ultimately if, if you can't generate enough fans for your event individually, right? Then, then doing a general ad with you or whatever really isn't, you know, as I tell people and I would tell our celebrities this, I could run an ad on you all day, Nick, right? Like no matter what, but at the end of the day, the people that I'm really trying to get to, that I'm trying to target are your followers, people that are self-selected to engage with your content on a, on a, on a daily basis, right? So for any individual celebrity, there's no better uh, you know, demographic than their follower base. You can run a million ads you want, but if I want to get your Nick, Nick's you know, event to sell out the most, your social media is going to be the people that actually care about it the most. I know you, got, you guys met, alluded to getting Kevin Hart on your pitch. Yeah, yeah, he was, yes, Kevin Hart was a, the guest shark for our, for our episode, which was, which was super, super cool. Obviously, you know, uh, he's, a, he's a super A-lister, you know, and it was his first time ever being a guest shark. And so like to be able to get that experience was just like, you know, super crazy. I mean, we love Damon John as well. Would have been great to have him on the show as well, but having Kevin Hart in that seat was also, was also a win. And how did that happen? Was it just by happenstance? Like it was this complete accident? Yeah, like we we didn't know in advance that he would be like we, we kind of surmised on our own, like following Shark Tank and like you know, through their social media, we were like, maybe he's gonna be our guest shark. Yeah, Tank. because like they announced them right like around the, you know, like when they announced that he would be a guest shark, you know, and we knew our filming date and we and we and we thought it made sense, right? Like in terms of what our product was, we're like, it would make sense that if he's gonna be a guest shark, if they're looking at all these different companies, our company, you know, just fits, right? It's an entertainment company, like it just fits stuff that you would probably try to put in front of him to, to see to pique his interest and so we were super excited when we when we heard that he would when we saw it on the social media that he'd be a guest shark and we had our fingers crossed like man it would be so dope if we get to pitch uh pitch kevin Hart. and then it happened yeah it was cool man it was super cool like you know uh obviously by the time you filmed then you you know you, you know it's confirmed at that point by the time you're like you know walking into the tank you knew before that but uh yeah you know it it, it was surreal so do you change your pitch at all knowing that that Kevin's going to be on it or do you just like you 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 keep it the same way it's always been but it's nice to have him in the room. Yeah, I mean without giving away any spoilers, I definitely think that, you know, you know, if you're a savvy business person, you got to, you know, try to tailor it a little bit. Yeah, 100%. I would tailor it a whole bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, you might look at the guy and say something to him, you know, that probably makes sense. Like, what's been the hard part of it? Is, is it is it the celebrities go too low with their price or is it that they go too high with their price so it doesn't support the platform? For sure too high. <laughs> for sure too high, right? Like, not even a question. Yeah. What's a too high number for, I don't know if it's a 10, 20, 30? I mean, I've had, I've, I've had like, you know, I won't say names, but I've had bona fide like superstars want to charge $1,000 for, you know, a meet and greet. But it's like, you know, you, your legacy is amazing. You're a great person. But if, if sometimes it's hard to have these conversations with people if, you know, they're not at the peak of their popularity. Right. And so maybe there was a time where they could demand those rates, but maybe that they, they, they can't do that now. But also getting them to understand, like what the product is. Right. Like you can't akin this to, hey, I, like some, you know, we guys ever said, well, I charge five thousand for one social media post. Right. Like for one Instagram. But well, you can't equate it that this is a different product. Right. Like, like fans aren't looking at the monetization in the way that you are. Right. So, you know, I can, you know, some people are like, I can make you, you know, twenty thousand in a month if you set your price at this and there's to be a good volume. But if you said at this, I, I don't know if we'll sell, you know, 10. Right. And like it's a delicate balance because at the end of the day, we always tell our talent, like only you can determine the value for your time, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's your choice at the end of the day, but we also, we want to see you be successful because we get a percentage of the revenue. So we also like are vested to make sure that the price is set right so we can sell. Um, but we don't, we, frankly, we don't always win that battle. And, um, you know, I think we're more right than not because we have the data and we know what people can charge. But ultimately, hey, if you want to. Yeah, because it's their time. Ultimately, that's what they're paying for. And although it's virtual and it's not in person, it's still their time. And we know that those nuances make a difference as far as what we're giving to our fans. But the town is still like, this is my time. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes it is a little frustrating when, you, when you're trying to get a celebrity to set an appropriate rate that you know will ultimately lead both of us to success. But, you know, again, you know, it's always their choice and you're always delicate about that. So the episode comes out on, on this Friday. And we know from talking with past guests that there's always a Shark Tank bump. How are you both preparing for the inevitable bump and, and the traffic 
to your website? Have you hired more people? Are you, are you like getting more servers? Like what is your process in getting ready for this inevitable flow? Oh yeah, I, I love this question. So as you know, obviously I've seen different interviews like you, know, you only get three weeks heads up of when your show is going to air, right? And so for sure, like the first thing you're doing is you're on, you're on the t- phone with your development team, right? You're like, you know, can can our can our service handle this load? Like the biggest thing you work should make sure your website doesn't crash, right? Like we've heard that so many times in the past where companies just literally, you know, their website crash. And if your website goes down, let's say for an hour right after the show airs, like that's the time where you probably were going to make the peak amount of money that you would have made, right? Like that's just unacceptable. And so we for sure have made sure that our web uh, speed and performance is up, that our, you know, service, service can handle a, a high load for absolutely. We have a contingency plan. So we, you know, we reached out to, you know, different staff and agencies and things like that to be able to quickly scale if we needed to. And we we're putting together internal trainings, like you're doing all the, yeah. Hey, if, if the shit is the fan, like we got to be ready and we don't want to performance to slack. So we've had meetings, you know, daily talking about, you know, how we're going to handle things, right? Like in different contingency plan, if it's a, if it's another thousand, you know, orders per month, or if it's another 10,000, right? Like what's the difference and when do we enact this plan? So we have a written plan that we have in place. And it's like, when we hit a certain number, that's when we'll, you know, sort of push the button and, and fire all our cylinders. I love it. What does the thing behind you mean where it says go best friend? Is that, is that unique in some way to your company? Oh, actually, that's a podcast that I host with my best friend. So this is what <laughs> I call Go Best Friend Podcast. Yeah. What's, what's your podcast about? It's really just girl talk between me and my best friend, you know, shooting the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it's ironic because it launches on Friday. Um, and, and that date was was set pre- before the episode, but yeah. it couldn't have, couldn't have worked out better better for the for for Brandon for the podcast. So definitely on Friday, January 7th, check out the Go Best Friend Podcast on all platforms where podcasts are available. Do you guys envision this turning into like a television show at some point or, or like how far down the media, not the pot, well, maybe the podcast, but also just what you're working on now, you know, at some point, I always envision this thing where, so COVID hits and a lot of entrepreneurial beliefs get cemented, right? Where it's like, your employer doesn't really care. Your job never really cared. Your 401k was never going to save you, right? But all these things, like I've been preaching this forever and everyone like, Seemingly, I've been a dick. And then COVID hits and I'm like, you see, you didn't need to be in the office. You didn't need to work nine to five. You didn't need to be glued to your chair. Your do- your boss doesn't care. Your family's more important and your health is more important. Like I've been saying this forever and everyone's like, oh, it's <laughs> Absolutely. Really That's true. literally what you can say all the time. Yeah, it's true. Right? And so in that, I always think like, okay, I just want there to be like an awakening where maybe even through your platform, it's just like business to business. It's like, it's like entrepreneur. So a part of the celebrity thing is also just like a business workshop thing where it's like, I'm scared to launch my own company. How did you do it? And it's a quick, like 10 minute fire up session that, you know, isn't an audio book. It's not a two hour YouTube video. It's just like, boom, it's like, it's, you know what I mean? And I just, I just want platforms. I don't think the market's there yet. I know it's growing. Like you said, I mean, that's totally so I've launched keepinghendrick.com, which, which is that like I'm I'm just putting together quick digital products that businesses and resources can use. Right. And the next obviously would be my ebook, but teaching businesses like how to do this. Like I'm telling people like, here's how we started. Can Here's how we were from sitting on our couch watching these celebrities to actually like FaceTime and they're partnering and working with them and getting invited to their concerts and being on their tour bus and backstage, like, like with no, and I think this is the most important thing. We have no prior connection to Hollywood, right? Like none, like we don't know anybody, we didn't have anything. And so it's like teaching businesses how, how to do that or how to go from sitting on your couch, right? One day watching Shark Tank to like a producer calling you out of the blue and, you know, asking you to be on the show, right? Like, so teaching people like how, how you can, you know, sort of create that energy, right? And I think it, what you said is so true, you know, but the, the flip side also uh, that I'm always cautious about, um, you know, we're talking about entrepreneurship as well is like, I think that there's a balance, right? And I think the balance is there, as I always tell people, there's no great company in the world. And we hope to one day be a public company that doesn't have employees, right? And so we always strike that balance between like, hey, if, if you got an entrepreneurial bug, if that's what, that, that's what, you know, floats your boat, fine. But no, I always tell people, because I have a lot of friends who are entrepreneurs and they're like, I'm my own boss and I'm great. And I never work for mine. I'm like, that works for you. But you won't create a billion dollar company without employees, right? It just, it, it, there's no billion. You ask Bezos, you ask Gates, you ask whomever you want to ask, right? Every unicorn, whatever, you know, the next white combinator unicorn. They got a team of people, right? And if everybody, you know, if we if we push entrepreneurship too heavy, then how how's anybody going to create the next greatest thing unless unless we are robots and we're in like the metaverse and you're on your computer in your basement, right? And so I always try to strike that balance between like, if, if it's in you, 
then you do it, right? And and you pursue that passion because it's your passion. But if you want to, you know, make a good living and you want to be, as I always use the example, I'm like, you know, uh, Jamie Dimon, the CEO of Chase, is an employee, right? But I'm sure he's not like complaining about working for somebody else. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's a lot of opportunity and money out there being an employee, if, if that's what you want to do. So Kevin Hart, he did an interview recently and he, he talks about this employee thing and he, and he goes, I don't have employees, I have partners. Everyone on my team is a partner. And I just, that, to me, that was, because that's how I treat our podcast. I love that. Yeah, we have a team of people like, and that means I listen to you. That means I give a shit. It also means you have equity, you know, and I respect you. And even if I think your idea is shit, you're my partner. So I'm going to, I'm going to try to find a way to understand why this might work. And it usually, and that's how you keep people long-term too. For sure. I, I totally think that's how you keep people long-term because, you know, we started our building our team with virtual assistants out of the Philippines, right? Like, and, and I think people, anybody on our team will tell you that they have just as much say so in the decisions we make as we do, right? We give them full autonomy to make decisions, to, to, to provide inputs. And to your point, I think being a good leader is not just about like, I listen to everything you do and I do what you say, right? But more so about, I hear you. And I do, you know, at least listen to what you're saying. And I contemplate whether or not that makes sense for the company. Yeah, and, and that honestly, I'll take the CEO of Candy, but, you know. I'm sorry to cut you off, but that autonomy produces like more of an ownership feeling from our, our team members too. So we appreciate that. I've given every one of our people that work for our team, like that speech of like, I'm not hiring like somebody to do a project, right? I want people that own the business. So I don't want you to just focus on like, hey, you asked me to paint the back porch, I paint the back porch. I want you to like, when I hire you to paint the back porch, I want you to say, well, look, there's some splinters in this wood. Like I could paint over this, but like, I think we should change this board, right? Like, and like, that's the idea that I have. It's like, I, I, I've literally said like, I hire partners, people that own the projects and treat it like their own, as opposed to people that's like, you told me to do it and I did it, right? It's like, that's not, that's not really what, what we're looking yeah. for. Yeah, it makes total sense. What is it like working together? And how did you guys have to figure that out? Oh, we love you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a breeze. It's you know? so, oh, it's so It's huge. Wow. You're going to lie to all of our listeners? No, I, I tell people, so here's how it works for us. We have to have conversations in the compartmentalized space, right? So we, it, it is not uncommon if you're in a household to hear us say, as a business partner, right, we preface that. And right. then we have this conversation. Hey, I'm talking to you as, as, as CEO of Candy. Hey, I'm talking to you as my co-owner in this business, right? I'm talking to them like, oh, I'm talking to you as your husband. Because I think for us, when we compartmentalize that, then it's like, okay, we don't take it personal, right? Like, okay, if I say certain things to her and I don't say, hey, as your, as, as your business owner, then it's like, I'm offending her as a husband. But as a business partner, I got to be able to talk to you the same way I would any of my business And there's partners. some discernment there. Like, he doesn't have to call on you or anything like that. Or, the, or vice versa, right? Yeah. She comes to me and stuff as well. Yeah. Yeah. So it's some discernment there. <laughs> but I think the key is you got to compartmentalize. And you see that on Shark Tank, a lot of couples come on there. And I'm sure that they probably will echo a similar sentiment. But you have to be able to have these certain conversations. Because when you have a tough conversation about decisions that are made as business partners, that's a tough conversation. And you got to be able to have that conversation and then go upstairs and then, you know, have a good night's sleep and watch a movie and not have it, you know, be personal. It doesn't always work out that smoothly, but I think when you compartmentalize it, it helps. Especially, I'm just, I was just thinking for you guys to pivot, you, you know, you spent $200,000. I'm sure that wasn't easy to get. And then you have to figure it out. I mean, that's, that can put a lot of stress, but I think in that you've got to learn how to interact and uh, deal and, and what I love is Steve Harvey has a book and we listen to it and it's called Jump, right? Like, and he talks about the idea and I love the analogy. He says like, when you first jump out there, like you're going to get scratched on the rocks. You're going to hit some branches. You're going to, he's like, but if you never jump, you'll never soar. Absolutely. And so like, that was like a huge, you know, when we, before we even started Insta Speakers, we had that conversation of like, when we first jump out here, like we're not going to be naive and think that like, it's just going to blow up tomorrow. Like we don't know what the adversity will be, but we got to understand that it is coming and, and how we respond to it ultimately is going to be the difference between us being successful or not. And so it's like the knock on wood, the grace is that we didn't spend money we didn't have. Right. And so I think that helps. Like it sucks when you lose like 200 grand. And you, but but, uh, you know, the light stayed on, the water kept flowing. It, was, it, it worked out. I love that. Are you guys doing anything in the crypto NFT space? I'm, I'm going to ask every entrepreneur that I speak to this year. No, 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 man, no doubt. Like I've been going hard learning. I mean, obviously we, we own crypto, right? So we, we we definitely got, you know, in that space. But NFTs is something that I'm like super stoked about and like trying to figure out. I understand the, what it is, right? I get it. I understand. It, I've researched it. Now it's like making my own one. You, you know, it, it is really this like surreal moment where you're like, I could really pay a designer like to make this and like put it out there and like, you know, if somebody likes it, like I could make like, you know, like, is it really this simple? Like, what is, I'm, what am I missing? And I know I'm not missing anything, but as you know, like it's hard to like, you're not missing something in the T space. You're like, 
now nothing is easy, but you're like, it's really, people are really taking like this, you know, this whatever artwork and like making hundred thousand overnight. Like it's freaking crazy. It, it actually is that, that easy. I think the thing I've, I've picked, we had a call yesterday. So we have a, in our studio space, we have a big mural and it was done by a semi-famous artist. I would say he's a friend of ours. He did like a video with Snoop Dogg. He releases a, a NFT with Snoop Dogg. And so in that, it's a really cool mural. And I was like, you know, it'd be cool to make this something like animated. And then that led to, oh, we could NFT this. And then for people that listen to our podcast, it gives them a way of like literally owning a piece of our, of our studio. And I thought like that connection is really important to our community. However, in the NFT space, there's just people banking random stuff. And in that, there is no community aspect. And so no one cares. Right. And that's what that board ape and all that stuff is trying to do for sure. Yeah. yeah. And so for people like follow our podcast or even the artist or just want to start to dabble in the NFT space, we're going to we're going to launch one in an effort to see what happens. You know, and we really I don't. Yeah, like, exactly. That's the same thing. I'm, I'm like, I just. It's the jump thing again, right? Like, I'm just, we're just gonna jump with this NFT thing. And if it flops, fuck it. It is what it is, right? I'll take it. I literally was on Upwork, I think like maybe three or four weeks ago, like I got a job out there, like, you know, for designers, like they almost might create an NFT project for us. And, uh, you know, something that we're also thinking about with our talent, right? Is like, you know, can we create some type of NFT project with our talent to be able to launch, you know, schools of Probably could. NFT. I mean, like Drink Champs is doing it. Anytime someone goes on Drink Champs, they, they make an NFT with like that person's like stats on the back, like how many drinks they had. All, and it's really interesting. And obviously Drink Champs, they have the community though. They have the- Of course, of course, of course. I mean, the only thing I think about the NFT space though, is I think I like Gary Vee, you know, he, he talked about a little bit is like, you know, he, he, he akins it to like the inter, beginning of the internet. It's like, they're gonna be, there's gonna be this like bust, right? Like, because it's so new and so, and the bears entries are so low and so easy to get into that, you know, obviously beginning of the dot com, like everybody's making a lot of money, but there'll be a bust to reset, you know, things at some point. And so, you know, I don't know where, where that, where that, where that come, but I do believe it comes because I think at some point, like the barrier entries are just, too low is too easy for a lot of people to make too much money. Like that can't be the way forever. Like at some point, the market will have to correct itself to make it a little bit, you know, more tough. It's like literally, you hit, like this 12 year old kid, like, you know, made, you know, 500,000 yesterday from like the picture he drew in two minutes. And you're like, like because part of you are like, this is crazy. Like, like I don't get it. Like I, the board, hey, they look kind of cool, but you're like, and people are like the, the utility. I get it. I get all that, but it still feels kind of crazy. Like it still feels like, like a gimmick a little bit. If you like, I mean, if I've been honest, like I get it. And at the end of the day, I think everybody cares about it because everybody else cares about it. I guess that's the only reason why, right? I think all the celebrities are buying them because you're like, well, I don't care about it, but if you care about it and I can make money selling it to you, then, then I care about it. Right. Like, I think that's, it's been like this, like everybody jumping on the wagon. Because it's honestly that simple. We talked to a lot of people that have been in the crypto space since like 2012 and none of them have bought NFTs specifically around the board apes. They just, they don't get it. They're like, this is really a fad, but just like fashion, you know, fashion has a, a, a tendency to do the same thing. And so, yeah, that's all it really is. And and you hope, get in and get your money, man. Yeah. And really, you hope that these teams are doing like they have a five year plan or a two year plan to create more. Right. To create so people keep interested. But as you know, as I mean, you, you guys know, as intimately with your platform around celebrity, it is hard to hold on for that moment and make that it last, so hard. you know, five, 10 years. So. We'll see what, what crypto do you like, and then and then we'll wrap. Uh, we got Doge. We got uh, what's the uh, she, the dog? I, I can't even pronounce it. Shiba. We got Shiba. We got we got Doge and Shiba. Um, you know, right now I need Shiba to rally back because like I bought some at the dip. I bought some at the height. I needed I needed to like I, I'm hoping to have that like that Doge coin or Bitcoin story of like two years. Right, like, I'm I'm in for the long play on on both of them. I, I want to like. I had it when it was less than a dollar and now it's like $10 story as opposed to like a lot of people made a lot of money and got out, which makes sense too. I'm trying to hold long. In. So as we're going down the NFT road, one of the things we've been told is that if we wanted to allow people to pay, like if we wanted to sell an NFT, we need to give people a way to do that. And so um, right now there isn't a Squarespace MetaMask plugin. But would, would you guys ever think about like accepting payment via crypto directly to your Absolutely. website? I think you almost have to. I think I think you're like i think it's one of you'll be so behind right like you go to mall they got bitcoin atm right like you got to kind of get in tune with you know that and the other thing we're thinking about too and i'll give you a sneak peek like we're really spending a lot of time trying to figure out 
how we can do uh, meeting greets in the metaverse, right? Like, like have, you know, somebody's avatar, like you're actually meeting with the celebrity, but like, you know, the, your avatars are meeting, you get access to exclusive, you know, club, candy, the candy club, or, you know, whatever. Um, we're exploring that again, but it's one of those things where like, I remember Snoop Dogg was on the thing with Kevin Hart yesterday. He said, you know, he's like, he got a, a virtual real estate in the sandbox. He's like, I don't understand this shit, but I'm making money. You know, it's like, it's like, that's what I feel like the world we're in. Like, that's the quote. Like, I don't understand this shit, but I'm making money. Yeah. We're, I mean, we're thinking about the same thing, doing like a podcast studio in the metaverse. Cause like that, that's needed. And how cool would that be? That's kind of cool. We can bring people into our studio without, and even like in a COVID way, right? It's like, oh, we can't yeah. meet, like, meet me in the studio, put your shit on and like, I'll see you there. Yeah. And like Afrotech's conference the last two years has been like that with this virtual sort of world where you have your avatar and they're walking around they're dressing and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, obviously Nike and all these other companies are like super capitalizing on virtual fashion. So, I mean, I don't know. I think you got to get in tune, whether you like it or not, whether you agree with it or not, whether you understand it or not, you, if you don't get in tune, you're going to be lost behind. It's going to be a lot of people making a lot of money on this like next gold rush. And so it's like, yeah, it's I don't fully thing. understand it. I'm like, I don't see myself being like in a virtual space for 20 to 20 hours a day that everybody's predicting. But I mean, you know, we're adaptable. Same. Well, look, I appreciate you guys coming on the podcast. Thank you guys. Tell everyone where they can find you, where they can support, uh, what they can do, who they can book with, all that good stuff www.meetcandy.com candy with an i so c-a-n-d-i celebrities and influencers it's, it's an acronym uh same thing on socials uh instagram facebook twitter meet candy mm -hmm. and then again uh also you know you want to meet celebrities we have maya tori spelling chris Kattan, uh, how, uh, some of the biggest housewives hall of fame athletes some of the biggest tiktok and instagram influencers in the world check it out you know book your favorite celebrity the, the standard rate is five minutes so you you get five minutes you can purchase up to an hour we have fans that book an hour at a time and some celebrities accept those bookings some don't some do and so you can get you know you can meet with somebody you always idolize and believe it or not for us most of our bookings aren't gifts the other platforms majority of the bookings are gifts majority of our bookings are for people that want to meet the celebrity themselves and i'll say the last thing like 40 percent of our fans have used our service at least four times 70 percent of our bookings on a monthly basis come from repeat customers right so we really do have a stickiness we see people create a friendship. I really would say what separates us, if you're, if you're listening to this podcast, you want to know what separates us from Cameo or any other platform you heard of. The difference with our platform is this. People use Candy to create friendships with their favorite celebrities and influencers. When you come back on a podcast and Tori Spelling's like, hey, Nick, I, like, I noticed you got a haircut. Or like, Nick, last time we, like, where's your dog Sparky that I saw last time? Like, that's what you get when you book on our platform. Because if you meet somebody for a Zoom, I, you know, we've been on here for almost an hour, guys. If I, see, if I see you guys on the street, we're gonna recognize each other. That's what you get when you do candy. So that's why I meant most of our fans, 40%, at least four times, because they're like, yo, this celebrity actually gonna know me. If I just walk down the street now, Tori Spelling will recognize who I am because we've talked for, you know, for an hour worth of time before. That's what you're getting on. You wanna create a relationship, a friendship with your favorite celebrity? Candy's the place to do that. Boom! That's a pitch, baby. I like it. Let's go. <laughs> really for you guys. Hey, I appreciate you guys, fellas. Man, thanks a lot. Thank, thank you for having me. Thank you. The Startup Storefront team consists of Diego Torres Palma, Natalia Capolini, Owen Capolini, Lexi Jameson, and me, Nick Conrad. Our music is composed by Double Touch. We release a new episode each week, so make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a thing. Our handle for all social media platforms is at Startup Storefront. We also film all of these episodes and put them up on our YouTube page because there's just some things that can't be experienced through audio alone. You can always go back and listen to any of our other episodes available wherever you get your podcasts and on our website, startupstorefront.com. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.